Good evening, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Three Fingers Forum. We are joined by a very special guest this evening. Her name is Dawn Duke, and she's a professor of Spanish and Portuguese in the Department of World Languages and Cultures at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She was also my dissertation director, so I'm proud to call her a friend and a mentor. And she was awarded the Lindsay Young Professorship 2021 to 2023 for excellence in research. She is the current chair of the Portuguese program and one of the former chairs of the Africana Studies program, which is now a department. She is affiliated faculty in the Latin American and Caribbean Studies program. Her graduate studies were completed at UNICAMP in Brazil, the University of Guyana, and the University of Pittsburgh, where she completed her PhD in Hispanic literatures. Her research focuses on Afro-Latin American literature with a special interest in women's writings. Her book publications include Literary Passion, Ideological Commitment Toward a Legacy of Afro-Cuban and Afro-Brazilian Women Writers, Archifactos da Cultura no Ceará, Formação de Professores, A Escritora Afro-Brasileira, Ativismo e Arte Literária, Celluloid Chains, Slavery in the Americas Through Film, and she's holding up some of the copies here, and her latest is Mayaya Rising, I'm pronouncing that right, and it talks about Black female icons in Latin American and Caribbean literature and culture. I just want to say welcome to the show, and we appreciate you accepting that invitation. Okay, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for the invite. To, uh, it'll be fun chatting with you about this latest project of mine, this latest, this latest what I call birth, because you know every yeah. every book is has its process, you know. I'm I'm excited that we're able to talk about this book. This was just released in January, I believe, of 2023. Yes. And um this is just another contribution to the field, um, just another um contribution to your body of work that you've shown. I know you all saw her in the background showing her books that um she's contributed to. And um it's really unique in a lot of different ways. I want the audience to kind of get a sense of what the book is about. We, we will go into some detail, but it's more or less painting a picture for the audience as far as um what you do um in your field. Like, what exactly do you do with Afro-Hispanic studies in Latin America? Mm -hmm. Great. That's a great question. Well, I mean, over the years, you know, you have different phases in terms of, uh, so the topic is one, but you go through different phases and I think probably I would say that my first phase started when I was in Brazil. I lived there for six years. My first two degrees are from there. So my first real project that took me into towards the direction of um, a focus on Black writings was probably my first master's. My first master's was in applied linguistics. I did it in Brazil. And I focused on Chinua Chibi's Things Fall Apart. And what I did, that first master's was focused on applied linguistics with a, with a concentration in translation. And I looked at the translation into in French, Portuguese, and English of Chinua Chibi's Things Fall Apart, a very famous book from Africa. And what I was talking about was, I was based on back then, post-structuralism was big. And it was based on, um, it was kind of based on the notion of translation as transformation, you know, in terms of making adjustments to kind of capture, try to capture the essence of the book. And at the same time, reproduce the book in a way that the receiving culture could appreciate it in within its own dynamic setting, you know, that of the book, but also that of the receiving culture. So that I think was the start. And then after that, things expanded. Um, I shifted back to Guyana. I did Caribbean writings for my masters and then on to um, Pittsburgh where I pushed right back into uh, focus on Spanish America insisting all the while that I concentrate, that I maintain or sustain a high level of involvement when it came to Brazilian writings. It was at that point that I zeroed in and started to focus specifically on the idea of um, writings by women of African ancestry in Latin America as a whole. I, the first, the, the, the dissertation ended up being this book, the um, so it was kind of um so it's it all started with Cuba and Brazil 
and um, the possibility of being able to go there to do research. And that really consolidated my understanding of what it means to be a black woman rider in the in Latin America, what it means, what it meant to be um black. It was it's kind of like an intersection that is interesting because of course, you know, when you say you're a rider in Latin America, this is back in the 70s and 80s. Now things have adjusted a little. You know, it there was automatically a, an automatic assumption that you were kind of like an um, you were part of an elite. You know, you're part of the upper class because access to books, access to writing, access to literacy in places like Brazil, for example, were was something that was very, very restricted. The massive amounts of the population simply did not have access. So adding the fact, so being a rider and being a black woman was a little bit of a kind of like a, it, it was something that was abnormal. It didn't follow the norm. The expectation of the rider is that a rider is somebody who's more prosperous. But the, Af the Afro-descendant women with whom I contacted and who were beginning to write Conceição Evaristo, um, Miriam Alves in, in Brazil, in Cuba, Georgina Herrera, um, and Nancy Morihon, of course, part of the system, uh, Exilia Saldana in Brazil, Jenny Guimarães, um, Alzira Hufino, these are all women who were part of a struggle. They were struggling with issues of um, cultural prejudice, racial prejudice. They were struggling with issues of um, gender gender prejudices. They, they were struggling with issues of race and class. And most importantly, they weren't rich. They were on the contrary. Many of them were quite poor and living under very precarious conditions. But they they were without a doubt riders, you know, and that is what attracted me to get to them. I had to go to them to get their books. Their books were not readily available. I had to get grants to go into Cuba, grants to go into Brazil. Later on, I had to get for this particular book. I had to get some more funding to go to get the books because the books are not available, not uh, easily accessible here. So I think that's it in a nutshell. It's, 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 there's a lot more I could say, but I'll take a pause here and see. Oh, I was actually going to follow up on that notion, um, probably the direction you were going in, because I was going to ask, um, and you may have touched on this some, but how difficult is it for a Black woman, especially, um, just to get um, inside of those publishing houses and stuff, for instance? Mm -hmm. Just the, the process of trying to publish something right, to right. a public that may not be receptive to that messaging. Right. I think the difficulty is kind of reflective of the difficulty that women of African ancestry have as a whole in Latin America. And I'm talking about places from the North to the South. I'm talking about Uruguay. I'm talking about Colombia, uh, Mexico, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Brazil, um, you know, so Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua, Guatemala. So, you know, over the years, pushing forward from the 1990s, you've had very, very few instances of um, really positive imaging or women in really prominent roles. I would say probably that one of the first icons of the region was a woman called Benedita da Silva who back in the 1990s, she was probably the first black woman to, 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 to attain a high, a very high political office. I think she became governor of Rio de Janeiro, right? Um, since then, we've had several, you know, things have changed over time. Um, there have been several other figures. Epsi Campbell Barr yeah, is well, another. Epsi Campbell Barr. But she became vice president of um she became vice president of um Costa Rica um then we had today Francia Marquez I oh, know vice president of Colombia 
Um, in the midst of this, we've had tragedy, Marielle Franco who was assassinated. So, you know, it's not that, you know, things have, things have been changing gradually, mm -hmm. but Kiko things have been changing too slowly, yeah. you know, and that, so that I think is a little bit of the problem here. You know, it's very difficult to, to, to have, to create, um, to have us create, create history, to create a sense of, of, of historical worth. It takes decades, it takes centuries. And so, and so therefore, the elaboration of the idea of the icon, you know, the, who, the, and this book is a little bit along that line, you know what I was thinking? How do we get to this point where we can recognize, appreciate, and, and really value our icons and know who they are, you know? I recall, um, you know, I've spent many years going back and forth to the big cities of Latin America, all over, pretty much from the north to the south, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, um, Ciudad de Panama, Panama City, uh, San Jose, um, Bogota, um, and everywhere you go, you know, you, you know, you you see certain icons that represent the culture, you know. Um, you go to the big, beautiful plazas, you go to the big cathedrals, you go to the nice boulevards, and what do you see? You see um, generals, you know, dressed in their military garb, some of them sitting on horseback in, in beautifully manicured gardens or surrounded by flowers or at the head of the immense boulevards and so on. They're all um, um, Hispanic, white, male, very uh, masculine, very patriarchal, very imposing figures, very tall, huge statues. Mm -hmm. And then it came to me, where are the statues or representations of women? Where are the statues or representations of indigenous women, Afro-descended women, African women? You know, uh, when they appear, they are never put in these places of prominence. They may be placed at um, an other side street, smaller streets. They never have the size and magnitude and glory of these other figures. On the country, they tend to be smaller, shorter, more specific in theme, and more at the level or height of the human, mm -hmm. the human being. You know, so I was like, what would it take? What would it take to construct a methodology that would help people perhaps those of us interested help us to design a, these black female icons in Latin America. What what do we need? How could we go about doing something like that? Mm -hmm. And that's how. And this is this is the work, and you know this this is the end product, the end product of of that process. The idea came to me in two thousand and ten. I was able to publish the book, and finally. <laughs> so I, I mean it took a while because also you know I was very ambitious you know I did multiple territories in fact I had to pull one of the case studies I had to pull the case study from Brazil because Chica da Silva was supposed to be in this book uh... she, she uh, you know Chica da Silva right that she's called the diamond queen oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. She was supposed to be in this book, but you know, sometimes um, you have you have plans, but things don't always work out. The, I I wrote out almost sixty pages towards the the chicken and silver part, but what happened is I started to struggle with it. You know, it I wasn't getting it to fit comfortably with the others in terms of design, technique, style, and intention. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you said, I said, you know what, Chica, I'm sorry. And I threw it in a corner and I said, no, I'm going to have to let you go because probably Chica da Silva herself deserves a whole book. You know, there's so much going on there within, underneath and around that particular kind of figure that probably that's why it was proving to be difficult to consolidate in a sh shorter space. 
but you know so the so the process has been interesting you know it reaches a point where you have to decide what to let go and what what will follow through you know and of course how to hold firm in front of the publishers who are always asking you to reduce 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 or eliminate or consolidate and so on but um so that's it in a nutshell i um can i talk a little bit about the cover yeah, I want I, I want to ask you one question before we get into like the thick sure. of the book, but it kind of relates with the book. So, kind of on that point when you talked about Sheikha da Silva, mm. it's interesting. I think compared to some of the other figures that you discuss, she's mm. probably more known in Latin America. And, I mm. mean, the movie productions and everything else. I mean, mm -hmm. you hear all these stories about Sheikha da Silva, mm -hmm. and um, but I think honestly, my personal opinion. I believe that that made the book almost more special and unique because you didn't have the Brazilian focus. Like yeah. I was kind of expecting, because when I finished the book, I said, like, where's Brazil at? <laughs> because I'm thinking everything, just all your other works. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question would be, how does this compare to your other productions? Mm -hmm. um, and just that process of maybe, um, do you feel like this goes against a grain sum as far mm -hmm. as um, including Nicaragua? which is a mm -hmm. country I think that's not as emphasized. And then yeah. with that space of Nicaragua, you're talking about the Mosquito Coast. Mm -hmm. But you're, not, you're talking about something within Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right, right. And the same occurs for all, for all the situations. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about it is Brazil is in this book. It's just not a case study, you know, right. but it is there. It is there. It's it's the basis of, you know, you know, some of the richest, some of the richest kind of, spheres of operation paradigms um spheres of research some of the best ideas have come out of brazil you know Leila gonzalez beatriz nascimento sueli carnero uh, conceição ivaristo with escrivivencia alzira rufino that she she talked about a mulher negra tem historia the black woman has a history you know, they became concepts in and of themselves. And that's what I was trying to show. I was trying to display that, you know, um, Latin American, Latin American Black women writers do not need, necessarily always need to depend on international North American paradigms or theoretical frames of reference to elaborate their own, their own, their own, or to, or to discuss or to theorize or analyze their own production. You know, they're creating, they reach a point where they have their own body of critical mass that they can use upon which to build a, a constructive ana analysis of what they're doing in their literature and in, in their prose and their poetry and their theater and so on. And that's what I was trying to show. And you know? I was trying to show, you know, you have great things coming out of places like Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, and so on that we can use as designs, as you can't, right, to use the word like a theoretical design that, that, that upon which we can base all our constructions and our analyses and so on of what is being written. When, um, when these writings started back in the day, probably 70s, 80s in Brazil, a little later perhaps, in, in case of Cuba, probably pushing through from, from the revolution, 1960s, you will you will remember that there was absolutely no critical mass. Nobody was writing. No, the literary critics didn't even know that this literature existed. There was no interest in in producing articles or discussions or writing or discussing critically in the academic journals anything that had to do with black women in Latin America or black women's writings in Latin America. Period. Okay, so what these writers did they had to produce their own critical mass. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you look at, right, um, Conceição Evaristo created Escrivivencia recently, okay? But she has been writing since the 70s. It's, you know, you don't come up, you don't come up on a, on a, on a something like that out of the blue. It is, it is the end result of a long process of decades of dedication, preparation, suffering, creativity and everything else that takes you to this place where suddenly you know something happens and it, and it's great you know and it just kind of consolidates everything that you've been doing for the past three four five decades you know it, it takes a lifetime 
And I think that's what um, people lose track of. You know, the fact that nobody was aware of them before 1980 or 1990 does not mean that they were not writing, that they weren't putting their thoughts on paper, that they weren't publishing, that they weren't using their little their own salaries and their own little money to publish and to write about these things and to get it out there. And very few publications, nobody practically knew about them. They weren't in the mainstream um, gaze or the press or anything, but they did it, but they did it. They persevered. And now I see we kind of like reaping the benefits of, of that perseverance, you know. Um, producing a book like Mayaya Rising, today um, is no less difficult because it required an understanding of their context, an understanding of their, um, an appreciation of their history, you know, as individuals, but also as writers and as part of a community, as part of a nation, as part of a country, as part of a region. And it also required me understanding how I can argue about the specificity of the of that particular cultural experience. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if I hadn't done literary passion, if I hadn't done this book here, a escritora for Brasileira, né? you're asking me why my eye, there was no Brazilian writer in my eye arising. And this is the reason this book here. I, I dedicated a whole book to mm -hmm. Brazil. You know, the writers are here, their essays are here, my introduction is here, you know. And so, um, and remember I was trying to get Chica da Silva into the book, but it didn't work, you know. So it wasn't for, for lack of this desire. It had this, I was, it was like, it was a real moment of suffering for me to realize that I had to discard or put aside the Brazil project, but I realized one that the book would have been too big and they would have made me cut it down uh, to get it published. And also I would have needed at least an extra two years to consolidate the Brazil part. And I was ready to close the project. So there are lots of things going on uh, underneath us too. Um, so I had to be satisfied with just having Brazil in my uh, context slash theory slash history introductory part of the book. And I felt satisfied with that. <laughs> I have one more question. I lied about the one before. It's just when you're talking, there's just so much like mm -hmm. flow with it. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, I have these parallel thoughts I feel. And it's like, you're answering questions, but then the more questions coming up in my head. But mm -hmm. I did want to touch on one more thing that you sort of referenced about the publishing process. Mm -hmm. How does the size of the publisher that you work with mm -hmm. influence your content? And I'm not saying that it does in your situation, mm -hmm. but what's the potential um, change of the content based on who you publish with? Mm -hmm. And have you seen this, um, I guess, throughout Black women writing experiences? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I do academic writing. So my first preference would be, of course, and I'm doing it as part of the career process. You know, this book... This book manuscript kind of helped me to be, be, become full professor. Okay. Um, they so because of my focus, my first choice was a university press. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I and it was quite a it was quite a difficult experience. I know my colleagues across the USA are facing the same kind of difficulty, you know, finding a press that would be interested in publishing what I write, finding a press that would be interested in publishing literature, the presses that do not want to publish literature. If they publish literature also, the expectation is that you're, you're probably going to be, you're probably, they're going to want you to talk about Black women writers in the USA, which I don't do, mm -hmm. you know, so I had that double difficulty of trying to persuade the press to take a topic like this when there's that huge concern that there wouldn't be necessarily enough of an audience for it. Or you're also faced with the fact that you're talking about things that the reviewers know nothing about. You know, oftentimes it's very difficult for, for folks like us to have the right kind of reviewers because the topic 
Uh, those of us who research this topic in the U.S. is a very tiny community, okay? One of the things that came up during the reviewer session that the, I, I had to go back two or three times to uh, redesign, I would say, some parts of the book. One of the things that came up, for example, was the fact that the book did not reference African-American scholars who had written about, who had written, who, who, were, who were also... Their, their work was different. They were doing more like comparative literature. They would do mm -hmm. Cuba, USA, Brazil, or they would do Cuba, USA, and so on. And they and they insisted that I include all that, all that, all the re those references in there, even though I was trying to explain to them, no, I wanted my book to be to be kind of like, you know, this Latin American space. But I think that's one of the um moments when I had to to give in because. In hindsight, I realized it also had to do with this notion of an appeal, an appeal to your audience. Who is your audience? Your audience is primarily a USA audience and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah? So you're talking about things that are very, very international, you know, but at the same time, the audience is here and they're looking for comparisons. They're looking for similarities and so on, you know, you know, you, there are moments when the expectation almost is that you can say, oh, can't say something about East, though. Oh, Nancy Morihan. They are the Toni Morrison of right. you know that kind of that kind of um so that people would say, oh, okay. You know, so they would click and say, okay, you they would understand in those words, in those kinds of terms, which is something that I wanted to avoid. You know, I wanted exactly. that to be taken on their own terms, right? <laughs> no, I just well for someone that's you know immersed in the field. Mm -hmm. It's just it's a more intimate experience with the text, mm -hmm. and um, I I don't know. I, I'm going to ask you a question because I know you want to get to the cover of the book, which um, oh no, that's fine. Very unique cover, but um, I was just thinking of just a plethora of references that you have in the book. Um, Columbia, you had the case study towards the end. Then you had mm -hmm. Nicaragua in the middle, which was the most interesting to me because I don't know much about Nicaragua. Yeah. And then you had the beginning with the Dominican Republic and Cuba, the whole clash mm -hmm. between the Hines sisters. But my question would be, um, how did you perceive this yourself when you were writing it? Because, and maybe I don't apply this to all the books, but especially the first um, part of the case study, the first case study with Cuba and the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic with mm -hmm. the Hines sisters. Do you see that as almost, I'm not saying that it's fiction, but do you see that as um, what we would call art, the critic being the artist at the mm -hmm. same time? Mm -hmm. Just because of the content that you're working with, mm -hmm. because there's so much indecision and mm -hmm. people don't know if these sisters existed or not, mm -hmm. what time mm -hmm. period they existed. And it almost goes back to that testimonial genre right. uh, where we're dealing with speculation and history, the mm -hmm. intersection of all these different things. Do you see that right. yourself as what your intention was? Right. So, you know, it's it's a little bit of a catch and one, but the, the um it was probably what I would call a three-pronged process for each of the case studies. The first part had to do with the um the the what I call the paradigms, which would be uh in the case of Cuba, the Dominican Republic. Uh, a mulher negra tem historia. The black woman has history. So that's that would be the paradigm or frame of reference. Then after that, the second prong is the triangle. The second, I would say, side of the triangle would be the actual presence, human presence, the Hine sisters themselves, their story, what we have about them, the whole debate as to whether they existed, what and so on. And what is their relationship with El Son Cubano? Would they have been, would they, were they in fact founders of the Cuban nation? Because, you know, the nation comes into being when the nation has something to call its own. And El Son Cubano is kind of like a, a huge reference in Cuba because it kind of symbolizes the formation of Cuba as a separate and in, in individual independent identity. The means you can identify some kind of musical, in this case, a musical genre, you know, very concrete, very specific, that only is that, that, that's Cuban to the core. 
the nation is born. And here we are saying we're fighting to defend the idea that it's quite possible that one of those sisters might have been the composer, author of what is considered the first Cuban son Cuba, the first son Cubano ever. You know, I mean, the magnitude of something like that, vis a vis the perspective of Black women in history is profound. It, it goes a long way to changing the dynamics of historical discourse, okay? Mm -hmm. And then here comes, of course, the famous ethnomusicologist who debunks everything, tears it up, splits it apart, you know, and just by engaging with the musical genre itself, you know, and questioning historical process, a historical process that was created by all of the major historians and ethnomusicologists and anthropologists in the country, Alejo Carpentier, Guillen, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's, it's, it shows, anyway, so the whole point of this was to show the challenges we face. And even as, and it was not necessarily to solve anything. That was my intention here. My intention wasn't to solve the mystery. You know, my intention here was to show just how challenging it is sometimes to do what we call a, 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 a contemporary process of historical recovery, you know, and, you know, that kind of like, from the contemporary that gaze backwards, that constructing a history from from contemporary position, but con constructing a more like an, an older, more distant history. You know, we can imagine things and so on. That's why I like literature. And then the third part to this triangle, you know, so we have the sisters, you have the, the paradigm itself. And the third part was the actual literature itself, the poem Yanya Tierra. And the embracing by Aida Cartagena Portalatin, who is the famous uh, Dominican poet, her embracing of the sisters and her development of her, her own designing of her own historical discourse and its embedding, its, its challenge. She challenged the patriarchal system of colonization and militarization, and she took it and transformed it and made it a woman-centered, she produced a woman-centered discourse. It was a beautiful process, only possible in literature, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, that's, so that's the design that covers all three. You know, you have your, your theory, then you have your actual person, and then you have the literature, and they kind of like coming together in a kind of like a trifecta effect mm -hmm. to, to support the point that I was trying to make, which is, you know, if there's a methodology to this, this might be it. And I definitely saw that consistency um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and I promise audience, we will talk about the actual book. Like we are talking about the content of the book, but mm -hmm. the cover of mm -hmm. the book, that's something that um, obviously I think when people go to buy books in these bookstores and stuff, mm -hmm. that's one of the first things you see is the cover of the book. Um, right. which is very unique. So let's talk about the cover a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, could you explain to the audience like, what was the inspiration behind this, um, the maypole right here that we can see? Oh, gosh. Um, you see this? Uh, so the maypole, the, the maypole is um, it's kind of like a deep ancestral ritual. It's a deep ancestral ritual that is actually European in origin, right? It made its way into the Americas, but in its in its original form, you know, the maypole as, as the name as, as or as they say in um, Spanish, palo de mayo. Né? It's um, it's it's kind of like a strange thing because it's this ritual that is not. It was not in its original form. It had nothing to do with Protestantism and religion. It was kind of like this secular kind of um, ritualistic um, dancing and festivity and festival that would take place to celebrate the arrival of spring, the arrival of May, okay? The fertility, the, the blooming, uh, it, it, it was a moment of um, 
associated with with uh, with sexuality with the blossoming with fertility with with nature at its best with the rains with cultivation with the harvest and so on so um and of course um so it finds its way into um the americas i think it's through the german moravian church mm -hmm. at least from what i'm seeing here this is the case in relation to uh, Bluefields, uh, Bluefields, the, the the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. You know, the, the main town there is Bluefields. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the Moravian Church is a church that uh, Miss Lizzie was a part of. You know, she came up in the Moravian Church. She talks about growing up. She talks about her, her love for dancing. She talks about the stigma associated with back in the day, you know, 40s and 50s, when decent young women simply did not dance in public, you know, that kind of, that kind of, um, you know, very conservative, what you consider conservative, but very protective, or very, what you call proper upbringing back in the day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first chance she gets, she immediately brings back this tradition, you know? The tradition had died down. It had fizzled out and she brought it back. And from then on, it became part, it, it was kind of like a launching pad for what they call, for the carnival that they have every year in Bluefields today, you know. But um, so it's interesting. So the thing is, Maypole, the way that uh, Miss Lizzie envisioned Maypole is a little different from the kind of, the kind of, more erotic kind of dancing that you see associated with some of the kind of some of the folklore, the folk songs and so on that that are more electronically played today. Mm -hmm. She takes she takes the original traditions and she she uses them, you know. And the and the wrapping of the maypole therefore is something that um that she builds on. She uses it as an excuse, she uses it to develop community relations. She uses it to teach people about their history. She uses it as a way to uh, include the young girls, the young women, to give them something to do that would keep them off the streets. The same, she encouraged the young men to come and play the instruments, to join in the dancing. So, you know, it was, it was more than just, it was more than just historical recuperation. It was a it was her way of a, a design strategically meant to secure and develop and enrich and bring back that sense of community that she saw dwindling away, especially into the contemporary period, you know, mm -hmm. into the 21st century as all these other influences came into being and it suddenly became old fashioned to do certain kinds of things or to be a certain way or to dance or to, to refer to old forms of music and so on, right? So that I think, and, and was she successful? Hugely so. She got she got the support of the Nicaraguan Sandinista government mm -hmm. and so on. But, and most importantly, she, she helped the community to gel and to hold, hold firm, you know? Um, she, they produced a lovely book La, La Memoria, I think it's called Memorias de Bluefields. It's a, it's a bilingual, a little bilingual book. Very nice book, very nice cover. They produced a, um, a video, a YouTube video. And, you know, so it was, um, so there were several um, moments there that were very, very interesting. The group became so well versed in the steps she was an excellent teacher they traveled they went to several countries they represented the sandinista nicaragua of the time you know they were able to travel and they became quite famous and you know she created she brought back something that gave people a sense of purpose a sense of their history a sense of their origins and you know that i think perhaps was the most important part, why she became the, I would call the icon, uh, you know, the icon of this particular town at this particular moment. Right? I, mm -hmm. I, just, had a, I had a just, question about um, mm -hmm. the, the some, I guess to give the audience a sense of the type of people we're talking about, mm -hmm. are these Afro-descendant peoples you're referring to in Nicaragua? 
Yes, they are, of course. That's an important point. These are Afro-descendant peoples who trace their place of origin back to the Caribbean islands, the English-speaking Caribbean islands, like Jamaica, Antigua, Barbados, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, Trinidad and Tobago, and so on. This is, that's the place that they migrated from. When you go to Blue Fields, you will feel as if you're in Port of Spain or Castries or Bridgetown. It's amazing that they have the same accents, the houses look the same, they dress the same, they eat the same kinds of foods. You know, they like the plantains and the mm -hmm. cassavas and the salted fish and, the, you know, and they, they use a lot of coconut. And, you know, it's like you are in the, like, it's as if you are on the Caribbean island. You forget that you are, you are on, you are in Central America on the coast, on the Atlantic coast. It's unbelievable. You know, you feel, you have that island feel to the place, mm -hmm. you know. People go to church, um, people speak English Creole, um, their references, the words they use, they remind you the, their accents. It, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's like, it's as if they never left the islands. You wouldn't, it's as if this, this too is Caribbean, which is, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a continental Caribbean, but it's clearly a Caribbean identity without a doubt. I like um, the part. I like the yeah. part in the book where it says, um, "I think it was Lizzie that may have said, we have our way. We do it our way. This is ours. Um, not African, not British, not indigenous. Just one hundred percent Costeño. Costeño, one hundred, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, without a doubt. You know, and um, and you know, she did. She did everything. She did right by the community. She was a maestra. She was a teacher." She met, spent a lot of time teaching them how to speak English, as we would say, properly. You know, even though she knew sometimes it was on a spectrum that they would be speaking Creole, but in school they were they were they taught they were they were taught how to read and write English. So much so that as, she, as the book explained, it was difficult for them to become a part of of Hispanic Nicaragua because their legacy. In terms of family, their ancestors, their their parents, uh, where they go to school, where they go to university, that legacy is a Creole legacy, you know. So many of them struggled not so much with English, but they probably struggled more with Spanish, you know. But of course, they're in a Spanish nation, and many young people are thinking of migrating to the Pacific Coast or to Managua and so on to get work or to go to university and so on. And they suffered discrimination every time they spoke as a result, you know, because there was this sensation of them being, oh, they're from the Atlantic coast. They're from that other Nicaragua, you know. And we have this, um, and there's a very similar mechanism with this that happens in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. um, especially in the Hispanic Caribbean, where you have um, the English speaking um, populations, a lot of, right. you know, Black people, and I uh, think in Costa Rica, there's a more of a direct link from Jamaica to Costa Rica. Right. Um, it sounds like here is more of a British, um, I guess, influence. Right, so. right. But Jamaica is also a British yeah. colony, former Right, British colony. right. They, they have some of the same kinds of trends going, the idea of... Um, the idea of um, Jamaica. Jamaica is very stands out, you know, because it it's it's a little bit of an an iconic representation. You know, they say things like um, Jamaica Town. You know, that kind of, they call they call that that place a kind of like a represent a reproduction perhaps of of the island itself and their their fascination with it. Many of them. Born, bred, and raised the writers, a couple of the writers in uh, Bluefields never traveled to Jamaica. But when they speak, you would not believe that. You would believe as if you would feel as if they they had just arrived from Jamaica. <laughs> Perf a perfect Jamaican uh, English, a Jamaican Creole with all the nuances and the 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 musicality and the, and the particular kinds of vocabulary that goes with with that kind of manifestation. It was incredible, it was incredible. Um, something something to see. And, and the two cultures don't necessarily touch. 
you know, which living uh, blue fields or blue fields in Nicaragua or Livingston in Guatemala and the island of Jamaica itself, you know. It's not to say that there's a lot of back and forth. On the contrary, there's probably more contact with the Creole community in um, New York City than there is contact with the Creole community in Jamaica itself, you know, as many people migrate north. Sorry, I had to uh, mute. Yeah, that's fine. I'm talking about, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this book. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the cover, the cover is amazing. The cover, um, I have to really, really thank um, Dr. Althea Murphy Price. Althea Murphy Price is a professor in printmaking at the University of Tennessee. And, you know, I approached her and I asked her, you know, if she would help me design a cover. She asked me what what she what I thought I wanted, and I told her, you know, some and um, I did this for the first book. You know, I picked, you know, you can pick one small element because you think you're thinking about this. You say, but this little element kind of represents what I want to see. You know, Mayaya refers to Mayaya, which is of course Mayaya rise. Mayaya refers to um an Afro-Nicaraguan, Afro-Bluefieldian, I would say Bluefieldian goddess called Mayaya, who is related to the month of May and seen, you know, there's not much information left about her, but Miss Lizzie seemed to know and appreciate this, this myth, this legend about this, this goddess Mayaya, you know? So she has her version of it, probably based on oral traditions and what was passed down to her, you know, as a child. So, you know, there's a lot of slippages here in terms of orality, what is history, what is myth, what people remember, what they hear, what they recall the old timers telling them and so on, or their parents growing up and so on. So I was, that was the universe and I was playing with that a lot because that helps to construct culture. You know, it helps to construct a very specific identity. In this case, a Bluefieldian sense of self. You know, so um, so I was talking to Alti about that, and she came up with two designs, very close together, and they were beautiful. I mean, anyway, they it rep it, it kind of represents the idea of rising. You know, I uh, I kind of like I did. A, an inversion, because you know the the palo, the 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 pole or the trunk of the tree has potentially phallic symbolism, right? But in this case, I sub I I subverted it. I made it my own, and I inserted the word mayaya. So I gave it that kind of that I gave it that kind of, I took it in another direction. Uh, and then of course, the different colors of the ribbons, you know, kind of representing the process of the wrapping of the maypole, which we know of course was an important, it had its technique. You have to know how to dance around the maypole to get the wrapping mm -hmm. to perfection. Of course you have to do an in and out weaving and so on. That was very important. Those of us who danced the maple would remember it. I danced the maple as a child, so I remember it very well oh, awesome. at, at, at church fairs, you know. So the maple makes this um, journey from Central Europe in ancient times and ends up being co-opted as a, as a kind of like a cultural reference that Miss Lizzie uses all the time referencing it or seeing it as an Afrocentric or like an Afrocentered or like a, a Caribbean Bluefieldian uh, manifestation that represents her people, you know, mm -hmm. her people, her people. Who are they? They're the Creoles, they're the Afro -Nicaragu Nicaraguenses, the Afro Nicaraguans who live, they're the Costeños who live on the coast, the Atlantic coast of. Of Nicaragua, those are her people, you know, mm -hmm. from all these different legacies. I think it's interesting to um, mm -hmm. so let me get this straight for the audience. Creole refers to, mm -hmm. um, I guess, generally speaking, a black person from the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua or yes. other parts of Central America and Latin America yes. that um, speak English as a. That's kind of like the the main emphasis is the language. 
Exactly, exactly. They are Afro descendants. They trace they trace their immediate ancestors back to the Anglo Anglophone English Caribbean islands. Um, many of them came through around the turn of the of the twentieth century. You know, coming in, uh, coming into that particular space. Um, for socioeconomic reasons, um, the Caribbean had just come out of slavery a, a few decades. And they were going through a kind of like an economic crisis. There was no jobs. And so the men board, many of the men boarded these ships and made their way into Panama to build the Panama Canal, into Costa Rica and into Nicaragua, especially to work the railway, to construct the railway and to work for the United Fruit Company, that famous North American company that produced all the bananas and so on, the exports. And uh, they made their way into Central America. They made their way into the Dominican Republic. They made their way into Cuba. When you go to those places, you're going to see enclaves of English-speaking Black peoples whose origins are they associate with the English-speaking Caribbean. I, um, and also you have Mosquito, mm -hmm. um, which is, and then Garifuna as well. Mm -hmm. Not so much Garifuna in Nicaragua, there's more Garifuna in Honduras. Right, right. Uh, but that's still, so how's that dynamic? Is that all considered part of the same community, generally? Mm -hmm. Right, I met, I met everybody, pretty much. Um, because they all speak English, the the, Gari, the nobody, uh, the, 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 Gar, the Garifunas, they... They speak Garifuna, they speak English, they speak Spanish, you know. So they they speak all three languages very well. And they're very proud of being Garifunas. Garifunas, another another word for Garifunas would probably be like the Black Caribs. Mm. You know, as they they trace their origins to St. Kitts, St. Vincent. Um, they see themselves as originating from as descendants of the Arawaks and Caribs as well. And that legacy, they talk a lot about that legacy vis-a-vis -vis the um, pre-Columbian indigenous societies, you know, that notion of a, of a pre-Columbian glory, you know, when, they, when those indigenous peoples were at their peak just before the arrival of the... Of, um, just before the arrival of the Spanish and the Portuguese into the Americas and the, the beginning of the end for the Caribbean, for the indigenous folks who dwelt, who lived in on the islands, because they, they were totally uh, annihilated, you know, they were totally wiped out. But that's their that's their core, that, that, that's their that's their origin, you know. And then of course they move into the uh, Central America and then the um, there's miscegenation with the with the descendants of slaves in those areas and the creation of a particular kind of linguistic um, phenomena, which is this language, you know, this language that they have. Besides um, Garifuna language, you have the Palenquero, which is the other language which has its own legacy and its own way of emerging, you know. Um, these these languages are very specific. You know, they, many of them they're struggling to survive, even as their nations are regrouping and strengthening. I believe that there might be as many as about a million, a million uh, speakers of Garifuna, maybe just somewhere in there. I'm not sure. Um, between uh, the countries of Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Panama, Costa Rica, you know. Uh, so you you, uh, you have and of course a uh, few of the people on the on in the islands of St Vincent, St Kitts, St Vincent, and so on. So they have a they have a very dynamic, very interesting legacy that has been well studied, you know, over the years as people try to sustain these African centered forms within a, a if, even within. Today, when things are changing so rapidly in terms of identity politics, mm -hmm. you know, and how we describe history, you know. Before we um talk some about um the Colombian case study mm -hmm. with the Palenqueras, mm -hmm. I did want to um 
highlight something to my audience that I think is worth mentioning about mm -hmm. um, the attempts to invisibilize blackness in Latin America, mm -hmm. especially from a US centric standpoint, because people in the United States, um, when they perceive Latin America, mm -hmm. there, there have been marketing campaigns that are still going on that even, even some of the, the quote unquote Afro Latin people in music and popular music in the United States now, they tend to be, um, is this image of the mulataje, the, the, mm -hmm. the mixedness mm -hmm. of Latin America, but mm -hmm. not necessarily connecting that with the Afro diasporic experience with black mm -hmm. people. Um, and I'm really surprised with fellow academics. I really am. I'm not really calling people out in particular, but it's, it's pretty frustrating and eye-opening that a lot of PhDs and, um, mm -hmm. and people who aren't black, mm -hmm. clearly they're not black, Mm -hmm. and, but there's still this lack of understanding and invisibilization of blackness. Like in Peru, I, I, I hear people in Peru say that they're not black people there. And I'm scratching my head. They're not black people in Mexico, but every space mm -hmm. in Latin America has a black presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this book is just um, all the more um, incredible in the sense that it's very much Afro-centered, woman-centered. Mm -hmm. And it completely dismantles any notion of um, there not being some kind of a strong, rich history. Mm -hmm. No, they, we have our own history. And I liked how you didn't use the U.S. framework. You mm -hmm. used, I mean, even though it's, it was very much male-centered, you touched on the negritude aspect, mm -hmm. um, influenced the quilombismo, like all that stuff, even though it's, um, it, it had dominant male elements at times mm -hmm. you still made it very much about the women and mm -hmm. um, you did it within Latin America and mm -hmm. I just think it's something that is worth the read for people who are just I guess have a basic ignorance when it comes to black culture mm -hmm. I think this would be a pretty eye-opening text for people to read mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much for that comment I you know I was trying to I was you know you know there's there's a there's two so among scholars, this idea that, um, oh, is it possible to do a whole dissertation on women only, on women writers only? You say, are you sure there's enough there? You know, these are the kinds of um, perspectives that we still have to face, you know, and then I have to fire back and say, you know, even if I do only women writers, you know, um, the, res the ending result is that I can I can critique, analyze, you know, assess and discuss any aspect of culture, you know, globally, globally, you know, women writers talk about everything, everything. It's not just because it's not just because that they have themes that, that are specific to their Afro descendant line, you know makes it specific they are like any other writer you know they have their they have they talk about their lives they talk about love they talk about global interests they talk about the environment they, and, and everything has touched them in a very intimate way and that is reflected in the genre of which they of which they are best skilled which is poetry if you want to talk about women writers you have to do poetry because the poetry is just amazing. So, you know, so you, you still have to face that kind of like reticence, that kind of like, that kind of idea that somehow um, your your scholarship is incomplete if you only do this. And that is so far from the truth, you know, because they have they, they, the, the vision, the perspective, you know, um, it's, it's just infinite. It's just everything is there. Everything is in there. Everything is in there. You become so wise based on reading. Just, you just need to read read them, you know, and see them, appreciate their wisdom, their experience, you know, their knowledge and their capacity as writers. Brilliant writings. Brilliant writings. I absolutely 100% agree with that. Um, it's it is is it's just revealing it's 2023 but um i've always viewed you like even before i came into the program is mm -hmm. like that's very forward thinking like we 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 remember our history mm -hmm. and stuff but we also have to keep 
um, pushing the paradigms like in, in, in fresh your and give fresher perspectives. And I think um, when I first got encouraged in the program to not be limited to Spanish language was a pretty revealing moment for me because that mm -hmm. told me that mm -hmm. I could basically do what I wanted to do with the black world. I could interact mm -hmm. with whatever other world I wanted to, mm -hmm. but that the black world itself in Latin America and Caribbean had all the pos the possibilities that I needed. I didn't need to look just in the Spanish language. I could do, mm -hmm. I could work with Brazil and 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 Haiti or whatever I wanted to do. And I, and I, it, it's really a liberating experience to be able to connect everything together, but at the same time, they're very separate. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of get that with this as well, mm -hmm. um, which leads to my question about the Colombian case study. Mm -hmm. I was so shocked. Honestly, and I studied this stuff as well, but I was really surprised because I think of Brazil and Cuba when it comes to um, the Yoruba influences. Um, Brazil, you have a lot of Bantu influence too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, the the Yoruba influences and the Orishas, I did not know that that was so prevalent in Colombia. In Colombia. That stood yeah. out in the chapter. I was like, wow, is, is this really a thing? Can right. you elaborate um, on the Lum that? The Lumbalu and the Quagrus and the, you know, there, that's, that's the thing, you know, um, you realize, you realize as you go out there, you know, and I have to do a lot of field research to pull this together. You know, you realize as you go out there that these communities don't touch each other. They don't touch at all, but they have what we call shared experiences. You know, there 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 are certain rituals, there are certain forms of spirituality that you see coming through consistently, and you realize that they all took, they all boarded the boats. You know, they went through the gates of no return. They boarded the boats. They came across together, but they were coming from a particular place. A, a diverse, a geographic, a massive space in terms of geography. But they were coming from, even then, they were coming from a shared experience, from shared experiences, you know. So you see that manifestation, you know. I went into El Palenque, uh, as we say, um, El Palenque de San Basilio, but they say at San Basilio del Palenque, you know. I went in there, then I did the um, blue fields, and then I went into the idea of Havana, talking to the ethnomusic, you know, and you and you start to see certain kinds of characteristics emerging, you know, in terms of um, in terms of what is what is able to survive, what is able to thrive throughout history that not that is not going to change because this is fundamentally who they are at the very core, you know. The case of um, Colombia is is um, interesting because actually it was in Colombia in Par Cartagena that this idea came to me in 2010 because you know Cartagena has all these statues of of these generals and these boulevards and the old city and they have they have they, you know they take pride in their history and mm -hmm. and Cart and Cartagena is important as one of the first ports of entry you know it has this legacy of slavery. And, so, so it has it has a lot going for it, and um, so my first contact there was um, I had a chance to go and see the Palenque, so we jumped into the car and they took us in, and there is where I saw the statue of um, Bencos Biojo in the in the in the in the square and the you know, um, reaching breaking the chain. You know that that very powerful effect motion, like if he was in motion, um, and even there I was like, but wait a minute, and the female figure, you know, so Benko's Bioho was central, mm -hmm. and that's when I realized, you know, I have to, I have to turn away from looking for statues and paintings and so on and get to the people, and that's when I discovered in. A black woman's organization there, and I was able to go and speak to the leaders, and um, I saw the dancing, and I realized, and I, I, you know, I realized that perhaps there was something here that I could do. You know, it. Um, I wasn't aware at the time of how I was going to find literature to complement things, but that came years after. That came in the mid two thousands when I was able to go to Bogota. 
and find these writings and then make the merge, you know, the theory with the writings, with the palinkeras, make that trifecta effect, create the trifecta effect in this particular case study, you know. The palinkera literature is invention, it's fiction, even as it is based on mm -hmm. solid ritual, it's based on the Lumbalu. They talk about the um, the ritual of um, the the quagrus. The quagrus would be like our today's version of fraternities and sororities. And they talk about the the myth of the myth of the um, I forgot the name of the myth. Um, you know, every everything comes together perfectly. You know. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, here is the palenquera. Here is her struggle, you know. Here is her, here is who she is. She, she loves color. She wears these colorful clothes. Uh, she, she's her own, she has land. She owns land. She owns her own home. She plants. She cooks. She's your, she's a clear businesswoman, you know. She knows how to work her business. She supports her family. Now they're they're palenqueras who have their PhDs. They're in they're in college. They're 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 teachers. They're doctors. They're lawyers. You know, and all because you know the country did a kind of like a semi affirmative action. They didn't go all out as in as in Brazil, but um, you know they created uh, something called ethnoeducacion, which is literally a kind of a process whereby they incorporated into the national curriculum specific specific policies directed at supporting and promoting the teaching of Palenquero language within the Palenques and some key areas in urban Palenques where there were where there were children going to school, you know. Mm -hmm. So some some the, the government did some key things there. And then of course coming off of the um of the uh, ten of the decade of the in Durham, the the Durham Conference, the decade of Afro descendants. I think it's coming to an end in twenty twenty five, you know. And in promotion and in support of that of that of that particular mandate, you know, that the, all the nations sign, you know, they did some very important things. They produced also that twelve to fifteen volume encyclopedia. Um, and in there, they had a, a whole, um, a massive um, anthology dedicated to, to 100 plus poets, uh, Afro-descendant poets. And there was also a couple of other key works as well. Um, so I was able to capitalize on the moment, you know, mm -hmm. and find literature when, if I'd gone a couple of years before, I wouldn't have found anything. I have to take a pay tribute to Apidama Ediciones, who is this publishing house, uh, dedicated to publishing women writers. And in there, they had they had she started collection, uh, she started a collection dedicated to Afro descendant women writers. And I was able to go in there and get the books, meet meet uh, Maria Teresa Ramirez, and talk to her and understand the dynamics. Maria Teresa Ramirez, of course, is one of the two main palenquera poets in this section. She's actually not palenquera by origin. She's a palenquera by ideology, you know? So she produced the bilingual, uh, she produced several of the bilingual um, anthologies, which is public publications in, pa in Spanish and in palenquero. You know, talking about everything about the, the Palikero universe. You know, the anthologies themselves are not nest are not necessarily woman centered, but you do have poems that seem to to drive uh, the feminine experience, the Afro feminine experience. So it was a very interesting. It was a, perhaps in many ways that was probably one of the most interesting um, field researches I've done because it took me into uh, Cartagena, it took me into Bogota, it took me to Barranquilla, where I was able to meet them. Also, um, other poets. And kind of trying to understand how, how because Colombia is different from Brazil or Cuba, so I had to make some adjustments to my understanding of how things are there and how to look for things, you know. And the topography of the country is different, which means 
it's difficult to get from one place to another. You actually have to fly. And that also um, determined the design of the case study because I was I focused on the Palenquero legacy and on the Palenquero woman. I would have liked to do something a little more nationally focused, but I went there and I found that that would have been impossible because of just of the topography, the geography, and also how very specific the regions are. The Cauca is very, the Pacific coast is very different from the Atlantic coast, very different from Cartagena, which is very different from Bogota and so on. You know? That's what I was going to get at with the question. Um, yeah. I wanted the audience to get a clarification on when you say Palenquera, where is their root word from? And mm -hmm. how did we get from Palenque to Palenquera? Okay. Right. So the um, the word Palenque means uh, uh, a community of runaway slaves. You know, we have several words that we use in um, Spanish and Portuguese speaking Americas. In, in Portuguese, it's quilombo. And they use the word palenque in Colombia. It's used a little differently in Cuba, the word palenque. I think it's used more like a, a, an idea of a village or a settlement, not necessarily connected to, to the fugitive, the idea of, of runaway slaves or slaves who've escaped and made their own made their own lives out there in the in the um, out there in the mountain, mountainous regions or deep into the forests. Of course, Colombia has a lot of forests, which is, of course, what facilitated the presence of so many Palenques in places like um, Colombia, the Guyanas, and in Brazil. So from that word, so they have always envisioned themselves as a people who were never captured. That is a little bit their legacy. When you say, I soy Palenquera, there's a force and a pride in it that goes with it because they see themselves as a people who were never subjugated, you know, who, 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 who were responsible for the construction and the creation of their own history, of their own legacy, you know. And that, I think, is very important when you, when you look at the Palenque. The Palenquero, you, you use the word Palenquero for the language. You say Palenquero. I speak Palenquero. And the word palenquero is uh, male, and palenquera would be female. You know, so those, so the words, um, like the word garifuna, the word of the language is the same word of, of subjectivity, identity. Mm. And the place, there's a specific word which is palenque. The most important palenque, of course, is the palenque de San Basilio, which is about. I think about 40 miles outside of the city of Cartagena. Yeah, 45 to the southeast, I think, is what you said. Right. Very, it's very easy to get to now, now these days. Before, it was much harder. Before, it was totally isolated, but not now. Yeah, and it's 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 a must trip if you go to if you go to um if you go to Cartagena. It's, it's a must. It's, it's something you must do. You know, just just to get a vision and see see what. To, just to see what the space is, kind of like um, stopped in time and contemplate issues of um, survival, transformation. Should they modernize? Do they want to modernize? Why haven't they upgraded? It's very, it could, in a sense, it continues to be very rustic. It's just almost like a sacred space. Mm. I think it's. I think it's one of these places that the UNESCO has. Um, place a certain protection on, which means they probably are not allowed to change it, you know, in any way. Um, it become part of the patrimony of humanity on the UNESCO kind of thing. So um, so it has that legacy of, um, of which they're so proud, you know, so, so proud, because these women, you see them in the streets selling their fruits and their candy, homemade sweets and so on. And they are a tourist attraction and millions of photographs of people who take them, just throw them on the internet. And so they're fighting, they're fighting for their worth. You know, there's a financial monetary value to all of this that is theirs by right. You know, so they, they there's it has raised some serious ethical issues about 
advancing tourism in a place like Cartagena and do, and doing it while abusing the image of the of the palinqueta, which of course, as you know, is one of the one of the main images of selling a place like Cartagena, which is of course this Caribbean romantic, very luscious setting. Um, that is sold throughout the world. It's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place, but there's a cost to advertising that beauty. And the use of the palenquera's body is there's a certain exploitation there that they're they're pushing back against now. I think they're much more organized now than before. They've unionized and so on, you know. A hundred percent. That's definitely the commodification factor and the exploitation factor yeah, because um just reading the literature, it comes up where um you know the people go I think it was a a novel by um mm -hmm. uh, Chaviano mm -hmm. and it talks about how they were going down the Malecon in in La Habana, Cuba mm -hmm. and the people there was a woman dressed up as Yamaya. Mm -hmm. But everyone was just taking pictures of her, you know, just, mm -hmm. um, they were just so mesmerized by mm -hmm. the, the Afro folkloric imaging of, um, nice. and, and yeah, that stuff is definitely more of a, um, unfortunately, that's a, a common trend. And, um, and that's always a danger when you, it when is. culture becomes expanded. Right. And then people start to take advantage of um those types of, um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. aspects of it without, without thinking without and without thinking or processing without thinking or processing the value the value that 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 human subject um represents you know i'm talking here you know you have the whole monetary thing associated with tourism but there's also kind of like a, a demeaning part to this where she's not necessarily seen for the historical, for the proud historical African value that she herself retains and sustains, you know, that she's coming from a particular place in terms of um, ethno cultural, uh, spiritual, and Afro African originated pride. And that part is lost in this very superficial, very immediate, uh, very Imme ple ple uh, immediate pleasuring entertainment world, which is tourism, you know, but um, her, she does her business in the streets and you know, the streets are a public space, you know, so it's kind of like a, a bit of a catch 21 there, you know, but um, she's holding her own, you know, so that third, that third case study is more like a generic of a, more like a generic study, you know, talk about mm. the eras, as opposed to the other two where I had identified individuals, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, it was worth it, I thought, to do uh, to do different kinds of things, you know, the two sisters and then Miss Lizzie and now the pal the idea of the palinqueta as a um, as a community, you know, mm -hmm. as, as community. You know, you said b before we go, I did mm -hmm. want to bring this up. Um, mm -hmm. I know you, you talked, we talked about social media some and how right. you know, you're not on social media, but I was, you know, I'm on social media a lot. And right. I, I, before this interview, I looked at some things, I watched some of the Maypole dances, and mm -hmm. uh, I really focused on Nicaragua because that's the one that I was the least exposed to. Mm -hmm. And that was a group. And you probably followed, you probably listened to the Soka and the Calypso music like mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, there's a really prominent group from Nicaragua that's mm -hmm. from the coast. Mm -hmm. They're like a big ensemble. They've had so many albums over the years. Really? And I was um, and I was looking at the titles and the titles were, were like Mayaya. Mm -hmm. um, what Mayaya La Semki. Anansi Sa? Yeah, Ma Mayaya La Semki. Which means Mayaya lost her key. Lost they yeah. say Betty yeah. Mayade. Um, and then there was an there was another reference in the book, just everything uh, corresponded with what you wrote in the Nick Ogwin case study. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting reading the comments because I would click on the music mm -hmm. um, group from just some of the groups that are representative of the coast of Nicaragua, and it's pretty much a 90 to 10 
95 to 5, I say positive, just like this is these are my people. This mm -hmm. is my Nicaraguan culture. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is this is such a great thing to see. Mm -hmm. This shows like um the the dynamic part of Nicaragua, like this is mm -hmm. the beauty of Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. But then if you click on a general mm -hmm. um information mm -hmm. um, video about Nicaragua, it's, it's nowhere it like, doesn't appear. The mestizos are like, oh, those people are black people, they're not Nicaraguans. Nicaraguans. It's so crazy the difference between they don't they don't appear they're not part of the nation. Mm -hmm. It's always this there's always this dynamic and it has it has to do with their history because remember there is this legacy of autonomy, you know, and they were granted full autonomy under the Sandinista government. They they were they, they, it was like a nation within a nation. They controlled. They control their policies. They control their education curriculum, their health. They control their governance, you know. So they, and um, of course now things have changed because suddenly the country has discovered that the Atlantic coast is the coast where all the natural resources are. And it's in whose hands? The hands of the, before nobody bothered about the Atlantic coast. And I'm talking about right through from Honduras, El Salvador, Panama, Costa Rica, into um, Nicaragua, Guatemala. Right through the whole Atlantic coast, that's where the resources are. You know, the resources, the natural resources, the iron ore and the and the bauxite and all this, you know, all the all the all the extractive uh, minerals that you need. And who in whose hands is are these lands? Okay. The West Indian, the the um, the Caribbean, Afro Caribbean communities, you know. So there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of land struggle going on right now, and there are lots of sad stories going on right now with people losing their lands, um, signing papers, being pressured to leave, uh, with big companies, whether for purposes of tourism or exploitation, moving in, taking over. Um, things have changed a lot in places like Bluefields in terms of the perspective, uh, in terms of the types of people that are there, and things have gotten a lot more dynamic than before. Before, nobody would ever go think of even ever moving there. Now, this, that has perspective has changed a lot, and those lands are up for grabs. They have become, you know, so it's become very volatile in some cases, especially in places like Colombia and so on where all the places of, of natural resources have become enclaves of clashes, you know, tensions and, and um, government in, and government um, interference where before there was none. So there, a lot of things have shifted with the times that we're living in, you know, and as a result of that, you probably would can expect to see a little bit more of eroding of the, um, of the cultural legacy, you know, as younger generations shift away from it, push towards the bigger cities, and as older generations, you know, become older and, and pass on, you know, certain things are being lost, certain things are holding firm, but certain things also you're you're losing. So that also is important. That's why I was I felt it was important for me to put some things in into the book, you know, kind of like you know, remind people of what 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 things were like, you know, and what things perhaps are important in terms of talking about literature and culture, right? Mm -hmm. I have one final, um, mm -hmm. it's not really a burning question, but it was more or less a thought. Mm -hmm. And then um, if there's any final words or acknowledgements mm -hmm. that you want to share with the audience, like sure. we're going to go into that. Uh, I was thinking about that. Have you ever heard of this novel called Seva? I've mentioned it to Seba. you before. Seba. Seba. And it's um it's a play on the word La Seba, the mm -hmm. tree. La Seba. How do you um, spell S-E-B-A? S-E-B-A. Mm -hmm. The writer is Luis Lopez Nieves. He's a Puerto Rican writer. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a historical novel. Nieves. Fictional, completely fictional. Mm -hmm. But um, it was published at the time, I think it was published in 1979, 1980, maybe. But mm -hmm. regardless, it was um, 
it was in the culture section of a newspaper mm -hmm. and people didn't know to take it as fiction or nonfiction. Mm -hmm. They just saw it in there and read it. And so it gained a lot of traction and it became really big in Puerto Rico, like mm. for lots of reasons. Um, we know that Puerto Rico is more or less a, a, a semi colony mm. of the United States. It has this mm. um, undetermined status. It's a commonwealth, mm. but the mm. U.S. Is, is a territory of the U.S. Right. So you had you have elements of the population that are already uneasy as it is right. when it comes to the question of statehood and everything. But the actual fictitious novel Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because the leading, the insinuation was that the founder of Puerto Rico, the mm -hmm. original space, was a black man. Mm -hmm. so, and this caused a complete polemic in the island when this came out. People just lost their stuff when, when they heard that. And so mm -hmm. I guess um, to tie this into what you're doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you feel like there's a friction because mm -hmm. you're talking about women, black women in mm -hmm. front of the nation, concepts of the nation, mm -hmm. and this thread of two black women possibly mm -hmm. being the founders mm -hmm. of El Son Cubano, mm -hmm. I mean, the Hines sisters. And then I thought about, you know, the idea of tango in Argentina and right. how people just lose their minds when you insinuate when realize... that's an African derived yeah. form of music. What, what would you say to people who, um, or I guess on the fence about it, they haven't mm. given one um, acknowledgement one way or the other. But mm -hmm. what would you say to people who are more skeptical of that mm -hmm. and just um, sort of solidifying that Afro contribution mm -hmm. to the region and how mm -hmm. it's not an exaggerated mm -hmm. um, contribution or essence in general mm -hmm. of Latin America and the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. Reminds me of that a very Cuban saying, ¿Quién no tiene de Congo? You know the rest. Yeah. Are, are, are you gonna are you gonna explain that one to right? You know. It's it's it, you know, we we are in the Americas, right? We're in the Americas. It's 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 in Guyana, I'm from Guyana. You don't say it's a melting pot, you say it's a pepper pot. A pepper pot, you know, you put everything in there. But in the end. In the end, you know, we are who we are. You know, you, you, uh, the thing is, different people prefer to claim different things, you know. And, you know, it's a little bit of a, a question of um, how exposed you are to the value of different things. You know, different segments of the population put more value on different different. Uh, identities, you know, and I think that I think is a little bit what is plaguing us here. Historically, there has always been a kind of like a negative assumptions and associations with Africanness, especially in the New World, you know. So anything, so we have a lot of things taking place today that have transformed people's people's minds, you know, have transformed people's thinking and transformed people's way of approaching this. And I think we've come a long way and I'm quite pleased with it. I think I think we, we, we're making strides, you know. Um, I was talking to some friends in Buenos Aires about notions of Blackness. There are certain cities where before you would not have had a Negritude conference, for example. Now they're all over in different spaces, you know. There are certain kinds of scholars who would never have touched black writers. No, they're incorporating them into their scholarship and into their publication. So things have shifted. Things are shifting. We're riding the wave of that shift, you know, in spite of in spite of more what I would call more narrow visions of who we are as part of these continents we call the Americas, you know. I always like to draw attention to the, um, the to the idea of the name, you know, America's, you know, the guy, America Vespucci got his name. And, um, you know, we kind of like, we're kind of like, they, they kind of fell into the Americas. They weren't, they were, they weren't too sure where they were going. So it kind of, like, and so we kind of like came out of this, a kind of like a symbolic kind of confusion of exactly how our, our quote unquote origins should be or is who's to interpret what and you know now I think now you know there 
they're debunking this whole thing about the, the indigenous came across the Bering Straits and this and that, or they're they're thinking, you know, uh, well, the, the, it might be possible that the Portuguese, in fact, were probably not the first ones who made their way into the Americas, that there may actually be every, strong evidence that Africans got here first. You know, so you have all these mixings and blendings and weird results we the result of all that speculation, right? <laughs> I call it speculation, you know, people, the scientists are working on it, the archeologists and so on. And every now and then you hear a different story, you know? Um, so um, but where does that leave us? You know, where does that leave us? Um, it leaves us with a, with a lot of information to process and it leaves us with um, perspectives that help us Think, rethink how we've written our histories. And I think that's extremely important. Um, when Brazil went to affirmative action, one of the first things they said was, we got to reconsider things. How are we going to reconsider things? We have to talk about African history. We have to talk about Afro-Brazilian history. We cannot not include it. You know, it's kind of like, it 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 makes us look incompetent. It makes us look um, incomplete. You know, you need to complete that picture, you know, and excluding certain things for political or ideological ideological interest is 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 not acceptable anymore, you know, especially if you want if you want to create um uh situations of of living that are compatible with you know well-being, kind of like a well-beingness, you know. We have to learn to appreciate each other. Um, we're we're living a moment of war, you know. There's a war going on right now, and uh, there's a quote that comes from Jose Marti. That's he says in moments it's on my door. In moments of crisis, the peoples of the planet have to rush to know each other. Right. Oh wow. And, yeah. Um. And he was, you know, he. You know, you know Jose Marti, he was this poet, he was this revolutionary, he died fighting for a cause. Uh, uh, an astute person, you know, he's saying, you know, in moments of crisis, do we pull apart? No, on the contrary, this is the moment where we, where we most have to figure out who our neighbor is, who is that person next to us, and understand where they're coming from, if you're going to make a change for the better, right? So that's the message I wanted to leave with you. You know, there's so many people I have to acknowledge. I acknowledge so many people at the back at the back of the book. You know, you read about the different peoples. There's a part about acknowledgments in the book where I bring to light all those people who over the years kind of helped to take me, bring me to the space where I could produce this book, you know. I keep asking myself if I have another book in me. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Um, but, you know, these single authored books, they take a lot out of you to produce. They take years to produce. And especially because you have to think through, to think things through to be very, very careful about what you do and say about how you describe people's places, things and how you represent things. And I, I try to do good scholarship. I think that's the least I can do. I, I need to do right by the cultures that I'm examining and that in the end is perhaps the most satisfying part when you finish the book and you get feedback and you say, oh, people kind of like really enjoy what you've written. And, and you know, so that, that is very helpful for me. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to this podcast. It allowed me to share a little bit the process, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, you deserve the recognition and... um. And like I said, I urge my audience to to purchase your books. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to link all of um your books in the de episode description. Mm -hmm. Is um is there a particular publisher? Do you want me to just do it with the publishers themselves instead no, of doing just the, the titles? They're all on Amazon, you know. Um, just pretty much the titles. They're on, they're available on Amazon. Some of them discounted, some of them too expensive. But hey, it's all part of the <laughs> no, it's all part it's of the well cost. worth the price. Um, <laughs> This cover, I was going to ask you, what's with the texture of this cover? I noticed that. Mm -hmm. All what right, it's very, it's very nice, it's smooth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't know. I'd have to ask the press what what the material they use. It's, it has a special feel to it. Mm -hmm. Very nice, yeah, very smooth feel. 
Oh yeah. But, One more thing to enjoy. But um no, we enjoyed having you on the forum. Um, like I said before, um, Sarah Omer has been on twice and we all know each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, but this ended up being a great one on one conversation. Yeah. Um, by Yaya Rising, Black Female Icons in Latin American and Caribbean Literature and Culture um, by Dr. Don Du. Um, again, my mentor and my dissertation director. Um, and yours truly is also a doctor now, in case the people don't know. I think oh, I yes. was exposed a couple of episodes ago by a guest or somebody said something about it. And then someone sent a message and said, Kiko, do, do you have a PhD? And I was like, how did, I was like, so I guess I might as well just expose it at this point. Yes, absolutely. But um, beautiful people, this is a wonderful episode 43. And um, again, we encourage you to be more open-minded and really expand into the world of um, Latin America, uh, Caribbean, because there's a lot of connections with the United States. So this is all the Americas. It's not just North America. We have a whole nother world out there. And so we need to kind of think in those terms more globally um, uh -huh. as opposed to uh, as own zip codes. But, Absolutely. Um, travel, travel, travel to these places if you can, you know, that's, that's, it's, they're wonderful. It's worth it. Absolutely, for sure. And I just, I want to travel so much now. I need to get me a job. I need to get me a <laughs> track job right. so I can travel because I always hear about you always out of the country. I'm just saying, oh, I want to, I want to be that person traveling to Cuba yeah. one minute. And absolutely it. absolutely and it's for stimulation it's for scholarly stimulation you know you can bring back books and but you come back you know with ideas and experiences that that really help in the scholarship and the teaching and the research and the writing every aspect of of who we are you know as americans absolutely i tell you what audience um don't fault me if the information isn't as understood but um, we had to bring Don Duke on to discuss this book, My Yaya Rising. Um, I think it is um, worth, I guess, studying up a little bit on the region. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you have issues um, reading the book, just get your pad out, write down some terminologies or whatever. But I think the general audience will get a good idea into the world of Latin America, into um, Black women writers, Black mm -hmm. female icons. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's highly recommended. And I plan on doing some kind of a review with this book. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that can enhance even more exposure to it. But uh, it needs to be well received. And um, people definitely need to purchase a copy of it. But beautiful people have a great evening. And we'll talk soon. Thank Cheers. you.